Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of All Things Logistics with me, Joe Williams, your host. I hope you had a fantastic week. We are continuing our conversation about the drainage business. Today, I'm going to talk to you about a report that I found dated this year, 2023, by the Bureau of uh, Statistics. And this report is put out every year, and it kind of gives what is going on with the ports, what is happening as far as volume, tonnage, who's got the most volume and tonnage, so forth. And I'm only going to go over the first part, and then I'll cover the second part in a different video. So uh, first off, let me introduce myself. I am Jewel Williams. If this is your first time to this channel, welcome. And on this channel, I help people understand what are some good business models of the freight and transportation industry? And I'm doing a series on the drayage uh, business model in the freight and transportation industry. If you have not subscribed, please subscribe to this channel. It helps support this channel. Also hit the like button on this video, share it, and then turn on your notification bell. So the next time I hit it, uh, uh, the next time I drop another video, you guys will be notified. All right, without further ado. We're going to talk about this report that dropped and it talks about the top 25 uh, ports in the United States. Now, they are breaking it out uh, by dry bulk, tonnage are the first two that we're going to go over. So this is a really good exercise to understand what's going on. Now, one of the things, let me get my notes, let me get my notes. So the first thing I wanted to go over is port governance. Who runs the ports? Um, now it says that first off, it's good to understand. It says given the diversity of port ownership, arrangements, operating methods, and cargoes handled, developing nationally consistent performance assessments for ports is a challenging task. So as you'll see here, ports are governed by different uh, entities. So they talk about the port authorities and public terminals. Uh, a port authority, also sometimes called a harbor district, is a government entity that either owns or administers the land, facilities, and adjacent uh, bodies of water where cargo is transferred between modes. So if you're having an issue, uh, it's going to depend on who's governing that port on where you would go for those issues. Then they have land lords building and maintaining terminal infrastructure and providing major capital equipment, but not engaged in operations. The port of Los Angeles, the port of New York and New Jersey and the port of Oakland are examples of landlord ports In this capacity ports may also offer concessions to tenants that make infrastructure improvements. For example, the Maryland Port Administration granted a 50-year concession for the Baltimore Seagirt Marine Terminal that included a commitment by the concessionaire to deepen the port of Baltimore's channels. Then you have operators directly operating some or all of the terminals in the jurisdiction. For example, the Port of Houston Authority is an operating port. And then you have up here, uh, let me scroll back up, Ju dictional bodies under which private terminals are responsible for, for for providing and operating their infrastructure for example the ports of cincinnati northern kentucky is a judicial judicial port uh body so that's just some example of the governance and they are basically that's how they've broken out uh these particular things and then they have here the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey operates airports, terminals, bridges, and transit systems, as well as the seaport. So they're that whole uh, jurisdictional body, okay? They're handling that whole jurisdiction. So one of the things that I find interesting about this, re about this information is now you can understand if you're in drayage or if you're looking at going into drayage, and you're getting different answers to your questions. This is why. Governing bodies between uh, port authorities, uh, jurisdictional bodies, the states themselves, each of them have their own rules and regulations. Yes, they fall under a certain umbrella. Uh, they might have some commonalities, but they are 
basing a lot of their uh, governance based on their location, the, who's a landlord, and so forth. Now, they have another group here. It's the private port terminals. Many dry bulk, liquid bulk, and railroad terminals are owned and operated by private firms and may or may not fall within uh, public port authority jurisdictions. Um, they talk about here that these three types of terminals are owned by vessel or barge operators to serve their own operations. They talk about terminals owned by cargo interests, such as grain terminals owned and operated by grain exporters and or petroleum terminals. Let's 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 um, follow. I want to come back to that. This third one is terminals owned and operated by marine terminal operators. I want to go back to this this one right here, this middle one. Uh, I want to highlight that because for those of you who are looking at what type of commodities you want to dray from the port, here are two examples. You've got grain exporters or petroleum terminals operated by refinery owners. So if you're looking at doing something in the tanking industry, or if you're looking at trying to get in with uh, oil refinery, um, you want to get in with the grain, there you go. That's the type of terminal you're going to be looking for. And now you understand, you know, where you would need to kind of steer yourself to break into that industry as a whole, get to understand what they need, when they need it and service that industry. Okay. And just know that that industry is going to be impacted by highs and lows. And you may want to have a side industry to make up for those highs and lows. Okay. So, um, then it talks here about, um, the cargo types. Uh, I want to scroll back up here. Cont cargo types. You're looking at containerized cargo, dry bulk cargo, liquid break bulk, roll on and roll off cargo. Well, I'm going to address those on a, in a later video, but I just want to give you an idea on what type of cargo that these organizations uh, handle. And so one, I want to get into ship size, uh, container vessel sizes, because they got a really good graphic here that gives a good idea of what these ships are actually bringing in. And it's amazing how they, how they run through this. So they have here on the left side, the container, uh, configuration cross section and then they got um vessel profile and then ship to shore uh gantry crane so on this first box you see this is a five they stack five containers above the surface line and six below with 13 rows across as 106 feet that is a humongous absolutely humongous and then the example size that they talk about here um they've got that this can hold anywhere from 3,000 to 5,000 teus teus remember are 20 foot equivalent units so with that you've got um the, the crane type now the next one they talk about is five above six below 144 feet across, making it 17 rows across. They're handling 4,500 to 10,000 TEUs. And then you've got the next one is the 160 feet across, 18 rows across, seven above, six below. And that reason probably for that less six below is you can see that kind of that curve right there doesn't give them that much room but this type of uh, vessel holds 12,000 to 14,400 TEUs and then the last one they have down here is 177 feet 21 rows across 10 above 8 below 10,000 to 20,000 TEUs so these are the main types of vessels that call the ports and as you can see they're bringing in a, a great amount of freight now looking at some ports are not all equal as size goes so some of those smaller vessels are probably going to more inland ports 
and the bigger vessels going on to the East Coast, West Coast ports. And this right here is just uh, valuable information for those of you who are getting into this business because you want to pay attention. What's the volume? How much of that volume you want to get? And as you can see how those containers are laid out, it's a first come first serve. So what, and what I mean by that is they can't dig through that pile and pull yours out and then get you going. They've got to pull those out as they hit them. And as they're doing that, then uh, they're just laying them out on the track. Now, some of those are going directly to the rail yards and onto the rails and then off to their destinations. And some of them are staying locally. They pull those off. So it's, it's a vast system um, that they have going on here. So my next look over here real quick, top 25 ports by tonnage. Tonnage, they're talking about basically weight. Okay, you probably already knew that. So my apologies not to make anybody sound like they don't know. But this is how they're ranking total. Uh, these are the top 25 ports based on tonnage. Number one is the Houston Port Authority. I thought that was very interesting, followed by Louisiana, Corpus Christi, New York, New Orleans, Long Branch, uh, Baton Rouge, Beauf Beaumont, Los Angeles, Virginia, Mobile, Alabama. Um, then there's the Pla Plaquemus. I don't even know how to pronounce that. And then Savannah was number 13. I was kind of surprised that Savannah was down that far. But this is the top 25 by tonnage. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they have more containers per se. They could have a lot, a, a lot of heavy containers, a lot of 40-foot containers in their shipments. Uh, so they may not, it, they're, that high tonnage doesn't necessarily mean quantity-wise, okay? So just keep that in mind. And this is the top 25 uh, ports based on dry bulk. And South Louisiana is number one, followed by New Orleans and then that Placus Mint Mines uh, Port District. And I think Savannah shows up. Uh, wow. I don't even see Georgia on the top 25 based on dry bulk tonnage. Interesting. So lastly, this was the top 25 based on TEU uh, volume. So how much, how many 20 foot equivalent containers were passing through that port? Los Angeles and Long Beach, number two, uh, number one and number two, followed by New York and then followed by Savannah. So when we're talking, this is they've got more containers coming through. So they're not just, they may be heavier or whatnot, but they are more volume. So if you're thinking about where do I want to position myself for those local halls, you want to start studying volume, asking yourself questions like how many of those TEUs can I move per day? What can I do? How can I do it? Where are they going? Start studying those ports. And I'm going to bring you as much information as I can on this channel right here to help you understand how that happens. So if you are not subscribed and you're liking this video, please give it a thumbs up. S subscribe and share this with somebody you know might use this information. And then turn on that notification bell so you're going to be notified every time I drop a new video. Now, where are these ports and location wise? So let's take a look. I'm going to scroll down here real quick because I saw, um, I want to take you through that, that painfulness. Yeah. I saw where it tells me the, um, vessel, not the vessel size, but the top, uh, 25 as it pertains to location wise. And that's where I want to, I want to give you kind of an, an overview of a, the map so you can kind of get that visual. So this is the map. And as you can see, nothing is hardly in the Midwest. So if you're, you're out here, chances are most of this freight is coming by rail. Most of this freight is coming by rail. Now you've got the Mississippi, Missouri river. You see, uh, 
branching up through here, up in here, Ohio River up in here. So yes, there are some ports for those guys. However, I'm betting, and I've got a I've got a map of the rail system. I'm going to be doing a video on that. But I'm betting that most of this inland stuff is going by rail from these perimeters. So one strategy you could probably think of is how can you be in have some um, business here on the outside, then positioning yourself or parts of your company here on the inside. And it's not going to be easy. I'm sure it's just going to be a high volume of competition, but this is just an idea of what you could be looking at. So you see this high concentration of Boston, New York, New Jersey. We know that New York, New Jersey were on the top five. We also know that Savannah was in the top uh, 10. Los Angeles and Long Beach over here to the left were in the top uh, one, top five, one and two. So these guys are going through some changes with the emissions. So keep that in mind. And then you've got Savannah down here. That's, you know, they're covering that whole region. You've got the connection. You've got Charleston, North Carolina, Tennessee, um, Alabama, Louisiana, all these guys right here cluster together. So I'm going to uh, end this video and Hopefully, I didn't overwhelm you, didn't give you too much, but I got more on this report that I want to bring you. I hope this information was helpful. Get your wheels turning. How are you going to position your business? How are you going to make money from this information? How can you get in with the ports? Be thinking about that, you know, understand your TWIC cards, you're understanding what type of equipment you need, understanding that uh, the chassis situation and Next, we're going to be talking about rail. There's a lot more to come and breaking down the freight drainage business. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for subscribing, and I'll catch you on the next video. Have an awesome day. Bye.